morning, everybody. Thank you for being here. Hi. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> so we have spent the... Okay, I need to speak in the microphone. <laughs> Um, we have spent uh, quite a year working together, and it has been very, very uh, fun and, and delightful experience. And tonight we're just continuing that, and to uh, give the opportunity to people to know you more, to discover you, and to share this experience that we uh, uh, we had together. So to start and to refresh uh, the mind of the people in the audience, would you? Uh, recall or summarize the experience of the residency? Definitely. So I just want to say it's been a pleasure working with you too. <laughs> <laughs> um, so over the past uh, several years, I spent a great deal of time at the McCord Museum immersing myself in the tens of thousands of female portraits held in the William Notman uh, photographic archives. And since January 2017, I've been the artist in residence at the museum. And it's during this past year and a half that I created In the Studio with Notman, which is not only uh, a new series of female portraits, but also a body of work whereby uh, my sources of inspiration, my process of working, and a glimpse behind the scenes is revealed to the viewer. Uh, to give you a sense of my process, um, uh, prior to each shoot, I would send mood boards to every single person I photographed. So uh, all the sets were personalized for each woman that I photographed. And this is uh, the kind of mood board that I would send, where it, would c it consisted of images of the Notman archive that inspired me for that specific person, for that specific shoot, an image of the backdrop to give the person that I was photographing uh, a sense of the colors, and, and the set. And so it was basically a collage of, of, of the scene. And um, this allowed the subjects to choose their own attire, which is something that is also new to my work. Um, so, so what you just saw was the mood board. Then this would be this, this is the set. And, and then the final image of Angelique, uh, Angelique Wilkie. Uh, this is, is, is the final. Um, image. And uh, for this project, I photographed over 50 women. And because it was uh, an exhaustive research project, I really wanted to show that component in, in the catalog and in the exhibition. So I created, if, if you've been to the show, I, uh, there's, there's an alcove space. And, and I'm, I really wanted to show the brains behind the work, like what, how these images came about, and, 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 and reveal. The, the sets, the references, and so on and so forth. So in the studio with Notman for me is um, not only, like I said, this a set of new female portraits, but also an ode to the practices of the earliest days of photography and, of course, my fondness and weakness for Notman's portraits of women. Uh, do you remember your first encounter with Notman? I do, and uh, actually, it was Raymond D'April who introduced us um, uh, because you wanted to work with uh, <coughs> students at Concordia in photography that were in a portraiture class. And at the time, I was teaching a class called A Boy-Girl Culture, which was an identity politics portraiture class. And we met, and um, uh, you asked me if I would be interested in working with you on the McGill Street exhibition and have students from this class uh, produce work specifically for this exhibition. So the premise was that you chose, you created a database and you chose images from the Notman collection and that the students in the class responded to those images. And then uh, on McGill Street, you had these panels, right? And there were images of Notman and the image that the students had created. Uh, it was a thrilling moment for both me and my students. Um, because it was the first time I came in contact with the archive. And it was an incredible exhibition oh, yes, opportunity for the yes, students. It was beautiful. Yes. Yeah, and it was, a, it was a huge success. But it was also a pivotal moment for me because I was one of the things that happened was that it was, like I said, it was the first time I came in contact with the archive. And I was really struck by the images of women in, in, in this archive. And what I found 
most remarkable about his sitters, this is an image of Ms. Gail Martin, one of the few images in the archive of a woman of African uh, descent. Yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, what I found really incredible was their sense of authority, their agency um, in the making of their portrait. Now, this is my interpretation, but for me, it's very evident in their physiognomy, in their gaze, uh, in the way they're holding themselves, they're really owning it, and I feel that they're very sovereign. And, uh, and this really stayed with me for many years, and I knew, uh, I knew then and there that I would revisit this archive, um, and I did, as evidenced by yes. my last two yes, bodies yes. of work. Yes. Yeah, yes. so that was it. So thanks, Raymond. <laughs> yes. I don't know if Raymond rem remembers that, but uh, I do know. yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so Marisa, could you uh, elaborate more on the image-making process? for the exhibition that is uh, upstairs right now. Okay, so um, I, I knew I had to do something different than what I had previously done, and I knew I had to do something good because there was an exhibition. And, uh, you know, that's always uh, terrifying and exciting at the same time. But it was while sifting through the archive that I came across this image of Annie Gray McDougall. And uh, this image really helped me develop a premise for the exhibition. And um, two things happened. The first thing uh, is that I really wanted to know more about this woman. Who is she? You know, and, 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 and so throughout my research, I discovered that she was also a photographer. Uh, she was Notman's student. She bought her first camera from Notman. And in her work, she documented, uh, she depicted daily life in the Drummondville and Pierreville areas of Quebec. And uh, so I, you know, I was thrilled to learn this because for me it was sort of like a wig to other female photographers. And the second and most important thing that happened was that I became fascinated with Notman's studio space because, you know, this is an image that's very casual for the time. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, you don't usually see the makeup of Notman Studios in most of his image. They're very, you know, they're cropped, they're refined, and they're sold, they were sold to the client not looking like this. And I was interested in the props that were casually displayed in his studio. I was interested in the negatives that were drying on the windowsill and all, all, all that was revealed in the studio for me was, uh, you know, it struck me, and, and I like that the image offered this information. So I thought, hmm, wouldn't it be interesting if I could also show the backbone of the studio? And I didn't know how at that point, but I, 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 I kept thinking about that idea a lot. And uh, from that, so then from that moment on, I, I decided to put myself in a 19th century space as much as I could, because we are in 2018, uh, 2017 at the time. But I wanted to work under similar conditions. So I decided that I wanted to work with daylight only and structure my studio in a similar way. And, no, and, and, and like I said, work with daylight no matter what the circumstances. So I, you know, I literally was in the studio with Notman, making portraits in a more elaborate manner. And I used this uh, residency opportunity, this research opportunity, to not only dig deeper into Notman uh, female subjects, but to also study the decor of a bygone era. So as you can see, this is a picture of Hannah Bozovic. Um, when I first started the project, I was really zoomed in, and you saw the backdrop of each model. And as I got further and further into the production and research, I started to back away, and I started to show uh, you know, things in my studio as well. And then this is an image of Carrie McPherson, where I also show the actual backdrop kit that I used at times. So, yeah. Oh, yes, but <laughs> what does the, the, the notion of studio mean for you, well, mean for you now? Well, I, you know, in a sense, in a sense, uh, what's, for me, the studio, I've always thought, that for me, the studio was a very magical space because it's, first of all, it's where artists work, where they produce, and, um, and that can be anywhere. It can be in your home, it can be in the landscape, it can be a traveling studio, as we see with many, uh, photog many portrait photographers of a certain era. And, or it could be a classic white cube in, in, you know, in an old factory building. But I love visiting artist studios because for me it's where you see the ideas unfurl. It's a very raw space and um, 
you see the mess, you see the failures, you see the triumphs, you see the books that the artist is reading, you see the images that are inspiring that specific person. And it's that behind the scenes that's not usually revealed in the final oeuvre that for me I find uh, fascinating as, mm -hmm. uh, as someone visiting a studio. And it's a treasure trove of secrets because it's also where you can really enter the mind of an artist and, and they expose a lot, so yeah. Mm -hmm. um, Excuse me. Photo yeah, okay. so I, I, I started to show images of my studio in an earlier series, which I'll get to uh, later on in the talk. Okay, okay. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes, yes. But at this point, now that the exhibition is uh, uh, in the gallery, uh, can, you, uh, can you tell us how it affected your vision, all this experience? You know, it's like Notman, you've been in Not with Notman for many years, few years, and uh, did it affect your vision? It did. Uh, first, I'd like to state that it was uh, the first time in my career that I experienced working as an artist in residence for a cultural, for a major cultural institution um, in order to produce a very specific project that converses directly with uh, a collection in a museum, in an institution. And um, the research and, 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 and production for this, this project culminated as my first solo exhibition, museum solo exhibition, I should say, sorry. And so it reached a wider audience, a more general public than I have ever experienced before, than the work has ever experienced before. So it, it affected how I was gonna work to a certain degree. But um, what it did, the most important thing that it did is that it really pushed me to, um, it pushed my portraiture work uh, in the sense that I, I really wanted to push my portraiture work to the next level and be more ambitious and more elaborate with the image making process, with the types of portraits that I would create. It, it allowed me to play with color, decor, lighting, and setups that I hadn't really done before. I mean, I had to a certain degree, but like, it, it was just something that was, it was very motivating, it was very inspiring, but it, 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 it was a project that involved the most important thing that I want to say is that it's a project that involved an exhaustive research component that I chose to reveal in the exhibition and the catalog publication. And um, working with the archive itself is really new to my work. Okay. And it has given me the experience uh, that I need for my next project, which we'll get to later yes, on we'll at the talk, top. We'll, talk we'll go about there, that yeah. After. But I understand that it's a kind of turning point. It's a know? turning point. Eh? It's a turning point. And, okay. and, and as you will all hear at the end of the talk, it, it's, it, in a really strange way, it's pushing me in a completely opposite direction yes, in terms of where I'm going with the work. But right now, let's go backwards okay. to <laughs> talk about your, the beginning, your debut as a photographer. Okay. By, with this simple question, how did you uh, become a photographer? Okay, so uh, my love of images started from an early age. And uh, my father is not a photographer, but he took all these pictures of me. And um, he was an amateur, and he took a lot of pictures of me, my mom, my family, and mostly portraits. And what I found really interesting was that <laughs> he's photographing me in different guises, in different roles, <laughs> oh, it's and so it's something that I do in my own work, so it, 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 you made me revisit that, and I had never really analyzed it that way. But I, I think he did have uh, influence to a certain degree, and he, was, and, 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 and he also took pictures of my mother, which were also in the family archive that I had access to. So seeing these images, you know, they have an effect on you. And so it stayed Oops. with me, because uh, when I finally could choose my own academic curriculum, I decided to go to Champlain College and uh, go into creative arts. And I took my first class with uh, Clara Gucci, who might be here tonight, I don't know. And I became completely hooked and completely enamored with photography. And I knew at that point in CIGEP, uh, in college, uh, that I wanted to pursue photography as an artist. Okay. And so, uh, yes, and then I went yes. to Concordia and, mm -hmm. and, and so on and so forth. So this is one of my first uh, images. Well, it's, it's an image that I took in college. It was, I think, my final body of work. And it's really funny, because when we were organizing this 
discussion, you made me revisit these images and they were tucked away in but my parents' basement. But we would basement. like to see more of that, you know? <laughs> we would like to see all of um, them. Yeah, they're not all good. So <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't... Um, I, I, it, it, and it was interesting because I, revi like, I went back to my parents' house because I don't have these images at home and I went into their storage and I looked through the the the... the the boxes of images that they have, and I realized that, you know, I was photographing women even back then. Yes, yes. You know, and, and, and that's how I started. I started photograph. I, it was it was portraiture from the very beginning. Yes, but yes, now I can really understand how you you got involved in portraiture, but you you chose for portraiture. You decided to to pursue to work in that genre. Yes, yes. So why 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 portraiture? There, yes, yes. Well, okay, so, um, I mean, I do, I love people, pure and simple. I'm a very social person, I'm a very outgoing person, and I'm definitely interested in the human condition. But I'm also, like, I'm always observing someone, their physiognomy, their facial expression. Even when I'm not taking a photograph, I'm always in observation mode. And it's, don't be scared about that. It's just something that, you know, it's just part of who I am. And I'm not judging, but sometimes things happen, you know, when you see someone speak or when you see them unfurl in a certain way that you think, my God, that would be really interesting. It would be really interesting to, to capture that on film. And, they, and, and people do fascinate me. I know it sounds so basic, but humans are complex. And, 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 and when they're captured on film, even more so. And what I love seeing is I love seeing my subjects unfurl before the lens. I think that when that happens, it gets really interesting for a portraiture photographer. Um, sometimes you could really x-ray a person. And I've been told that. And I didn't do it intentionally. I just, you know, I'm, I'm going, right. it, it's just something that happens. And, uh, you know, they, some of my subjects have said, you've, you've really revealed a lot. And I don't know what they, sometimes it's like very, very deeply personal that I don't know what it is. But, is you know, I, and I think that's really fascinating when that happens as a, as a portraitist. But... At the same time, is it true? You know, I yes, mean, yes. It's, it, mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't know if it's all truth. You know, mm -hmm. I don't even think it is. But thus lies the complexity mm -hmm. of representing someone on uh, camera. Yes, on yeah. it makes me think of the the photographer, um, the German photographer Thomas Roth, who in the eighties, you know, photographed did big, large ID portrait, and his idea was to ask the question, is there just a surface? Yeah. Is there something behind that surface? So th this is something that's it's a seminal question in in, uh, in modern portraiture, I yeah. would say. Yeah, right? yeah. And um, uh, did you ever photograph yourself? Uh, like yes, I did. <laughs> yes? Um, I'm yeah. not, like, I don't do, like, I'm not a self-portrait photographer, but I have included myself in a few projects. Um, in, in This is a, a, an image from Belle de Jour 1 where I uh, study different iconic female roles and I decided to include myself as a Frida, a Frida Kahlo type of uh, person, uh, ident uh, sorry, model. And uh, in Antonia's Garden, which is uh, a more autobiographical project, I created an, Im an image of me and my mother. I sometimes appear in my work, but I'm I, not often. So no, yeah. I prefer photographing other people okay. yeah, and be being behind yeah, the lens. Yeah, You're one or the other, I uh, think. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and uh, in the history of photography, who inspired you? Do you have some uh, photo female, but f photographer who inspired you? Could be there, are, there are many people yeah. that have inspired me and that uh, have uh, been seminal for me in terms of my image making practice. As you know, uh, a lot of my, it's not just photographers, I also love a lot of painters. But for the sake of this talk, I, I narrowed it down to five different people. And the first person I'd like to talk about is the Contessa di Castiglione, mm -hmm. uh, Virginia Oldioni, who was uh, an Italian aristocrat, a lady of leisure, with a remarkable work ethic. And um, she was a very significant figure in the early his in, 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 in the history of photography. Uh, in 1856, she commissioned Pierre Louis uh, Pearson uh, to help her create 700 in total, right? Uh, self portraits of her being photographed in different theatrical guises in uh, in different uh, outfits. And for me, I think she is uh, she's a pioneer of the performative image, and I think. Portraiture, there's performance in portraiture, and, 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 and it's something that needs to be acknowledged. But I think that with the Contessa di Castiglione, I was really, 
uh, attracted to her eccentricity. I, I was attracted to her aura. You know, I felt, I, I really respected the fact that she was in such full control of her image, which I respect and appreciate, of course. And the ways in which she played out these different roles before the camera was just fascinating to me when I first discovered her, much in the same way like when I first discovered Cindy Sherman. It was the same reaction. Um, and it's still, it's it's a studio work. It's a studio work, yes. you know? And, uh, and, uh, and, and, and there's theater, and there's play, mm -hmm. and there's elaborate setups, and there's guises, and, and, and there's all of those things that, you know, when I first saw these images, I wasn't thinking about how it would be explored in my own work, but I was fascinated seeing this woman play out these different roles. Um, the second uh, is Julia Margaret Cameron. She's very classic, I know, but um, she, for me, she was really interesting because she's someone that uh, took a lot of photographs of her friends. Um, she took a lot of photographs of celebrities of, at the time and very heroic as very heroic figures. And what I think I liked about her is I remember discovering her in, an, in a photo history class and how, you know, photographing your friends is legitimate. You know, mm -hmm. it's not silly. It's not, you know, just this no matter what. And, and, I, and, I, and I think it's an important genre because it's about your community. And community is very important to me. And my, my community is in my work. So, um, so that was something that I was really interested in in terms of her work. Um, I also, I mean, this is a little anecdote and we talk about it. I also like the fact that she started her career at 48. It gives me, a, it gives me hope that, you know, <laughs> you can change your life at middle age. It's okay, it can happen. Um, it's hopeful. And uh, I also admire her because she treated photo as an art rather than a science at the beginning of photography when everybody was using it as a commercial endeavor or treating it in a very scientific way, the maladies of being a photographer and a photography itself. Uh, but she was one of the first female photographers to really use photography as an art form and uh, present it in a very different way. So she's a pioneer in, mm -hmm. in, in her own way too. And what I really like about the work, which people didn't really appreciate at the time, and I don't always like this about photography, but I like that you saw the flaws. Yeah, she yes. wasn't good, technically, but it didn't matter because her images were, were so compelling. And I, you know, as a teacher, I don't really want people to think that I like really bad technical images, <laughs> but that. sometimes they could be really interesting, and it's about the image, and it's about the content. And in this case, it was about the ways in which she photograph the people in her life. And I really like the kinship themes in her work, how she worked with her friends, like I said yes, earlier right. on. Uh -huh. You know, I, I, I thought that was uh, uh, very important. Uh, Diane Arbus. Yes. Uh, you know, very far from anything that I do, but I, uh, she was a photographer that for me, um, I was really captivated by these very compelling images. I was, I was, I marveled at the fact that she had she did this with great aplomb and that she approached these strangers on the street and she worked with people on the margins of society and it was very you know controversial because of you know there the, was the idea of ethics that came into the discussion of her work and these were all ideas that you know fascinated me and that I was really interested in in learning more about and I think they're very compelling images and they stay in your mind and they stayed in my mind and um yeah, and I think it's mm. just because they're so raw. And she influenced so many, so, so many so people. Many people. Yeah. Want you, yeah. You're yeah. Never... And you see it now. You see it. You see it in so many people's work. And yes, yeah. yes, yeah. And you have others. Yes, I do. I have uh, Micheline Thomas, who is a personal favorite. And as you know, I love painting. And as I mentioned, I love a lot of pa painters. But for the sake of this talk, I had to narrow it down. Um, but what I like about painting is I like it when there is a conversation going on with painting and photography in an image, when they come together in an image. And uh, Micheline Thomas is, can do both really well, and she's known as, as a painter. But this is, a, this is a, a wall mural she created at the PS1 in uh, New York, uh, in, in Queens. Uh, uh, in Queens. Um, but what I like about uh, Micheline Thomas's work is how she, uh, her representation of African, uh, American women and how um, her work draws from Western art history, from pop art, mm -hmm. from and visual culture to examine ideas around uh, femininity, gender, race, 
uh, and sexuality. And these are ideas that I'm also drawn to in my own work. So, 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 so I'm interested in her images, I'm interested in her ideas, and with the, all the people that I've shown up until this point, it's not just an aesthetic attraction that I have, it's also an intellectual one, or has a lot to do with the content as well of the yes. work. But and so far, there's a lot of all, and in every of those photographers there, we can find that in your work. Okay. This is okay. something now that appears to me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. They resonate very strongly oh, yes, with yes. me. And the, the, final, uh, the final artist that I want to mention is Rinika de Jikstra. And uh, for me, what I love about her work is how she manages to capture uh, vulnerability and strength in, in this in courage in the same image. And I'm drawn to the... Um, social aspect of her work and the typologies of people that she studies and that she represents and that she investigates uh, really, really well. So yeah, so those are, I would say, the top this five. Is an another connection with you is your vulnerability, as you said. Vulnerability, yeah. Uh, yes. Yeah, because I think that comes, I think it's okay to make that come through in an image. Absolutely. I think, you know, so, and I think there could be uh, a juxtaposition of opposites of emotions and of of uh, awkwardness is something that is fascinating. It's not a bad thing necessarily. So yeah. So thank you very much for that nice <laughs> tour of the little history tour. Yeah. Yes, yes, it was nice to to uh, <laughs> review that because they have all I think touched us very much. Well, there Ma are discovered Micheline Thomas. I don't yeah, know that much, yeah, but no, uh, she's somebody I'm, that really when I first discovered her, I was like, who is this artist? And I need to know more about her. Yes, and yeah. Um, I mean, there's a lot of other contemporary of phot course. photographers, female and male, but for me, I think it's the ways in which women represent other women that I find. Uh, you're part of that group. Yeah, I, I, yeah, yes. I feel very right. connected, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, I know that um, Belle de Jour, the series Belle de Jour, is a kind of, uh, is very, uh, a milestone, I would say, I would say, in the, uh, your evolution as an artist. Yeah. So I would like to understand more how it emerged, how it developed, and uh, the, can you tell us the different steps of this sure. long series? Because it lasts about 12 years, I think, we, I, you yeah. worked on that. There were breaks in between with other projects, but um, it's with the uh, series Belle de Jour 1, uh, where I started to use uh, women as my, I started to represent women in my work, and I started, they were the primary subject. Uh, in my work as a photographer. And it's really with the Belle de Jour series that I feel I found my voice as an artist. And it defined me. It defined mm -hmm. me for a very long time and, and it still continues to do so. Uh, the first Belle de Jour series is, uh, consists of 30 large scale uh, color photographs depicting women in uh, different, uh, in various states of undress and acting uh, or posing as iconic female types called from the canons of art history and vernacular culture. So with that first series, it was really, you know, studying very iconic, like the Odalis, the Mona Lisa, you know, both highbrow and lowbrow. And in 2014, which was uh, more than a decade later, I produced the second installment of the series. And these new portraits were also used as a vehicle to uh, explore deeply entrenched standards of beauty. And I was interested in images that were imbued with uh, sensuality and that rendered my subjects physically and emotionally compelling. And the thing that became very obvious and very different for me in this second series was that I was also a decade older. And I was, you know, there were more and more um, uh, older women in the work, which you they were more sensitive. I was to more that. sensitive mm -hmm. to that. You know, when I when I did Belle de Jour one, I was in my you know it was early thirties, and it was like it was a, a rougher series in mm -hmm. terms of you know it was more a, a vindication of, of of representation. I would say with this series, it's not that I was softer; it was just that I was looking at different female types, and I started to get away from the fiction a little bit more. Right? Uh, they're still role playing. They're still in different guises. But it's not about iconic women anymore. It's about, you know, women that we see in in the everyday, but that are also, you know, posing as certain types. And uh, it's with this series that I wanted to emphasize plurality and difference, and really try to work with as many women from different walks of life and different age groups. And. Uh, 
one of the things that I wanted to also play with in, in, in these images is I wanted, like we were talking about that juxtaposition of opposites, I really wanted there to be this uh, tension in, 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 and invite the viewer to um, consider those underlying tensions between vulnerability and grace, between uh, uh, awkwardness and uh, composure, between naturalness and self-possession. So it's, um, it, it's, it's, it's a series that for me, uh, helped me develop, helped me get away from the earlier series and helped me get into the next body of work. So it's an extension of the original series, but it's a more in-depth study of contemporary representations of the feminine, which I feel, uh, you know, I'm getting more and more. It's, it, it, it becomes more contemporary and less, even mm -hmm. though there's a reference to an historical photographer, the women aren't in guises anymore in the Notman work. They're, they're wearing their, their clothes as they want to be. Uh, wearing. And so with both series, I really wanted to create, I ultimately wanted to create my, um, my own feminist narrative by using a language of subversion to, to comment on different type of beauty that is not dependent on um, artifice or uh, what's often associated with women in uh, mainstream images of women, I should say. Uh, you work so, with ages also, eh? I work with a lot of different, more uh, women with different ages in uh, this series. And, um, and then uh, we finally get to Belle de Jour 3, which is when my relationship with Notman started. And in, in, in 2015, <clears throat> 2016, I started producing the third installment of the Belle de Jour series, which is when I, I contacted you and I said, you know, can I have access to these archives because I'd really like to revisit the Notman collection. And, but and you, you were not in residence. I wasn't in time. residence, no, okay? Was, I wasn't it, in residence. It was your own uh, initiative. It was my own initiative, and Ellen said, yes, please, you know, she gave me access to the archive. And um, it, it was really my first foray into the world of Notman in my own work. And um, I was certain of three things. I was certain I wanted to work with Notman. I was certain that I wanted to show this work at the FOFA gallery. I know it's so specific, but I was really like, no, I want to show this work at the FOFA because it's, I knew, I had an inkling that it would be a very heavily, it would be a heavy research project. And I wanted to, and you know, that, that space really does encourage that kind of uh, exhibition. And I uh, contacted Zoe Tuzinha, who's here, and who is also the assistant curator here at the McCord, but wasn't back then, because I wanted someone to curate it, and I wanted it to be someone that was really well-versed with the Notman uh, archive, which you were, so. <laughs> um, so. So this body of work, uh, is, 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 is part of the Belle de Jour series, but it has another title. It's Belle de Jour Dialogues with Notman's Portraits okay. of Women. Mm -hmm. And it's with this body of work that I also wanted to encourage uh, viewers to witness and appreciate the extraordinary legacy of the Notman archive and to see how that conversation would present itself between Notman's historical images of women with contemporary images of my own. So uh, the show took place at the FOFA gallery. It was curated by Zoe. And uh, it was at that point that uh, Zoe also encouraged me to start showing my process. She, re she really encouraged and, 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 you know, pushed me and said, you know, you should, because she'd come to my studio and she'd see what I was doing. Okay. To and show the relation to with Notman, yeah. very obviously. And to also show, like, it's really interesting to see this wall of women in your work and to see all your post-its and to see, wouldn't it be interesting if you start to show that in the exhibition? And, it, and it's not something I'd ever done before. And I thought that was a really good piece of advice because it also brought me to working in that way also with my work that I did in the uh, studio with Namit yes. during this residency. Mm -hmm. So, this yeah, so I wanted to really look at... Um, Sorry, uh, not men's sensibilities. I, I was also interested in the eccentricities in his yes. work because you find a lot, you but know. But you kind of you really put the spotlight on that. You you reveal that, yeah. Notman, because often Notman is seen as a, the, the 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 repetition. You know, the the aspect of the repeti repetitive aspect of this work is obvious, but you really put show us that no it's very different and there's yeah. some things very special uh, aspect of it that we should uh, concentrate I, on well that that's the thing because in in the archive first of all 
where is it? It's 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 it consists of over four hundred and fifty thousand yes, images, right. and eighty five percent of those images. Correct me if I'm wrong with my statistics. Are portraits eighty percent? Yes, eighty percent. So it's really. It's super overwhelming when you first start putting in keywords into the database. And so at first, you know, they're very good women, women in the landscape, right. mother and child. And <clears throat> throughout, throughout that research process, I started to develop categories because I had to. It was the only way I could organize my thoughts and organize the ways in which I was going to photograph the different people. And so, so um, and also, how was I going to build this uh, relationship between past and present modes of, of representation? So there's like there's a whole series of costumed women, and and Marie was very she's the CEO of IBM. She doesn't usually dress like this, but <laughs> she um, uh, I sent her some images of Notman to give her like a sense of like where I was going with the project, and and I said I don't expect you to wear a ball gown or anything like that. Like just you know I'm giving you. Oh, she goes oh no no I'm gonna wear it. I have one. Okay. And I thought okay you're probably the only person I know that owns one. Beautiful. She really looks. She like really a and she lady, really yeah. took this like portrait very seriously. Yes, which I appreciated. And so 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 there's a whole series of costumed women. There's a whole series of regal and like you know more uh, yeah more regal women. But then there's a whole series of working women and there's a whole series of younger women. So. So there's 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 a lot to look at in the in the archive mm -hmm. and it's incredibly oh, overwhelming. Okay. So okay, yeah. Okay. 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 Uh, so in in reaction to Belle du Jour, uh, critics have present you presented you as a feminist photographer. Mm -hmm. I guess you agree. Don't you? I do agree. Absolutely yes. agree. <laughs> um, but more importantly, yes, I am. But I I am a feminist photographer. But more importantly, I'm a feminist. So, so, so that to me is yes, like, first, you know, art, first, 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 first off, and um, in all aspects of your life, in all aspects say. of my okay. life, yeah. Yes, but <laughs> in photography, how does it show in your in your photography? Like I would, as, the, um, regarding you know the stereotypes, the, the female stereotypes. Yeah. How do you work? Because my feeling is that you're not actually against the stereotype, but you work with them. So, so, there, so first, to answer your first question is, um, for me, it's like what makes me a feminist photographer, I guess, uh, a provocation to, um, uh, to look at women through a different lens, through a female lens, through an inclusive lens, through a lens that gives them agency, that gives them authority, that it presents them in a noble way, that uh, gives them, uh, you know, the right to say yay or nay. I don't want this picture produced. I don't want this picture shown. Um, uh, to try to represent as many types of women as possible. I mean, the fact that I've dedicated most of my career uh, to women, to the representation of women, is is important. And um, to be clear, when I say different types of women. I really want to be clear because it's different types of women in my life. I haven't, I don't assume to photograph every type of woman out there. I don't work with strangers. I don't make casting calls. Um, I work with women in my family, in my community, in my, they're my friends, they're children of friends. Um, you know, so it's essential to note that I don't assume that to represent everyone out there, but it is something that it stays in my mind. It's important for me to have that diversity in the work, but I need to do it in a very organic and very honest way. Um, so, so, so my representation of women is very personal, and um, like I said, I want there to be uh, also a sense behind the beauty uh, of the surface, and also to um, you know the humane quality, the psychological. Uh, perspective, the ways in which women are holding themselves, the ways in which they're being represented for me, the fact that I said that they have agency for me, that's really important in the work. It's the most important thing. And um, you, yeah, working against the grain. Yes, but I'm thinking of, of the, you know, in the studio with Notman, you work with flowers. It's it's something that very uh, traditionally associated with womanhood, with the uh, 
with um, beauty and fragility. So is, yeah. it, is there yeah. a strategy there? Yeah, I'm really glad you asked that question because y there's, that's something that you can get criticized about a lot, mm -hmm. which is I completely understand. There, there's that stereotype that we were talking about that I'm, I'm, I'm working against the grain, but I'm also working with it because yes. I'm trying to subvert it and I'm trying to turn it on its head and, and make people see it in a different way in terms of like, we're taking over that language. It's that language, those codes and conventions that we're used to seeing in mainstream images of women and taking control of that image and reclaiming it and reinventing it through a female lens that I think is really important to note. And I want to say something about femininity because not every woman is feminine and that's fine, but femininity is not necessarily something for me that's the opposite of feminist. Um, one doesn't exclude the other. You can be both. Um, and I think that for me that's like bottom line is that I want to be inclusionary and I want to be able to look at the different types of uh, ways in which to represent women. And I am representing them a certain way because that's me, that's my vision, you know, and somebody else would come along and do it differently and that's okay too. Uh, in fact, it is important that that difference exists because I think that's where the dialogue becomes really interesting. But I'm using that visual language, I'm using those codes and I'm trying mm -hmm. to subvert them. And, and like I said, turn it on its head. So there's that tension that's created in the work. You know, it's not just women in pretty flowers. I mean, I think that's just such a superficial reading of my work. And I know, I've heard it. Um, and it's, I, I expect it. But I also think you're not looking close enough. You're not really, you're not really looking at that image. And, 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 but you, you may be looking at that image and have that interpretation regardless. And mm -hmm. I have no control over that. But I'm not going to change because of that. You know, I'm going to stay true, steadfast and true to my vision of that. And, and I am working in a minefield of male fantasies. But you know what? I want to reclaim that and I want to make it my own. And I want those women that are in the images to say, you know what? Let's, let's, let's try to show a different take on it and, 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 and take authorship of that image or of those ideas. So, so, so they are enacting roles that are perhaps called from some stereotypical representations. But... They're not about perpetuating stereotypes. They're about reinventing them through a female gaze. And there's also irony. There's a bit of irony, yes, too, yes. you know? Mm -hmm. um, so, oh, and the flowers, yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, and I think that's really good because that's really important because, you know, you talk about beauty, womanhood, flowers. For me, flowers don't have a gender, you know? If you had said to me, I want you to photograph men for this show. But did you ever, did you always photograph women? No. I'm, I'm gonna, no. And I'm going to show yes, you, yes. I'm going to show you that I did not always do that. But if I had to, you know, if I had to photograph men for in the studio with not men, I would have used the same decor. You know, I'm not saying they would look the same, but I'm saying that I would have used the same strategies. I would have used the backdrop, the flower backdrop. So for me, there, there's, there's no gender to that. And I would shoot them with the same props. And the backdrops that are actually being used in the images themselves are like they're 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 images of art historical painters and they're all a lot of them not all of them but a lot of those images are men that painted those images and so they painted flowers and mm -hmm. you know that's okay Monet but it's also okay that I use them because you know um, like I said I I I want I want. I ask that they be regarded with the same kind of attention as uh, the masterpieces that I'm referring to in the grand tradition. So you ask if I always work yes. with women? No, okay. So I, um, uh, I have mostly worked with women, uh, but not exclusively. This is, uh, I've worked in the genre family narrative. Uh, this is a series I did uh, entitled Antonia's Garden, whereby, uh, which was an important autobiographical project for me, where I worked with uh, my matriarchal lineage and heritage in this project. Uh, and I also worked with a series, I also created a series entitled The Dandy Collection, which was a series of men. So, and, and in Antonia's Garden, there's also images of a male family member. So, I don't exclude them from my work. It's just that right now I was really entrenched and like really focusing on this aspect of my of my practice. Yeah. Um, so this is very interesting to see the men portraits. Well, you know, they're yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, it's it was different. It wasn't uh, there. There was a tension, which was interesting, and but I wasn't uncomfortable. It they was, were also your friends, and they were also and my friends. They were people I knew in my community. My dad, my 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 uncles, 
uh, my husband, a lot of people that are in my life. For me, yeah, I, I still approached it in the same way. In a way, they were a little bit easier to work with, but in a way, a little bit more difficult. You know, oh, it was okay. just, oh. uh, I guess, I don't know, there was, maybe now it would be very different, but I did this very early on. I did, okay. I, I, I created this series in, in 2004, 2005, so. Okay, so at the beginning. At the beginning, Bajou, yeah. So you, and then I just became really involved with other projects, and I, and I, I really felt that okay. it was important for me to to continue representing women. So, yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, oh yeah. Do you and have another one? Okay. Yeah. So so you asked me if it's just women, and uh, I also wanted to sh share with the audience that um, still life is something that I started to incorporate in my work with a series entitled Breathless. Uh, that I created in 2007. It's a genre in which I work in in between portraiture projects. But the first time I showed it was coupled with image. And in Antonia's garden, still life began to appear. But after I'm finished a very, uh, you know, after I finish working on a very exhaustive project uh, with people, uh, which is incredibly rewarding, but it is incredibly exhausting. Okay. And I need that break. I need the break from the, from the human presence in my studio. I don't want to make appointments with people. I don't want to ask anyone to sit still. I just want to leave something in my <laughs> studio and let it sit there. And there's such a relief. And it's, I, it was very therapeutic for me to do that. But, um, but I take it very seriously. And uh, it's, it's not work that's really been shown on its own, but it's something that I would like to show yes, uh, at one point. Yes, I'd, yes. I'd like to but do... But it will uh, find its time. It will find its time, yeah, yes. and I'm in no rush. And I know that, you know, I have a, a, a friend and a colleague that uh, we'd like to show our still life work together because she's also a portraitist. Okay. And it much works in a, a similar way and, and also very differently and that um, we would uh, eventually like to do a show, a collaborative show together. Yeah. So, so it, it brings me to my, my next question is to broaden the, the, the perspective and to ask you uh, what is your next project? Where, where are you going now? Well, uh, uh, so my next project, I will explore uh, something completely different, as I mentioned earlier on in the uh, talk. I, I'm interested in exploring how an Italian immigrant and Irish, but I'm going to take it from the uh, Italian part of the, uh, uh, of the work, of the, the equation, how an Italian immigrant community was uprooted and displaced during uh, the mid-60s for the Hallmark event known as Expo 67 in Montreal. And the, the, the neighborhood that I'm referring to is called the Goose Village. The Goose Village no longer exists. People were evicted and expropriated from their homes, mostly immigrants, in fact, almost all immigrants, mostly from uh, the Italian community, also from the Irish community. And um, they were evicted from their homes and their land was expropriated so that the city could make way for uh, an arena built solely for the Expo 67. And so this cultural heritage has been completely erased and eradicated even from Montreal maps until very recently. Because when I tell, people know a little bit more now, but when I was, nice. you know, when I talk about the Goose Village, like, no. where's that? Mm -hmm. It's near the Victoria Bridge. It's near Griffintown. It, it's part of that part. It, it's part of that uh, uh, neighborhood in the city. But um, with this new body of work, I want to address issues pertaining to exile, cultural patrimony, with a f and, and a focus on my father and his connection to this place. When my father first came to Montreal, that's where he lived. And uh, by means of an autobiographical... Oops. Is that your father? That's my dad. That's my dad okay. when he and first the, came it, to... Okay. Yeah, he was a bit of a fashion it's, victim, but yeah. Uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, no, he's, uh, he's, he's wonderful. Uh, <laughs> um, he was, he's a tailor, so fashion is a big deal in our family. And my mother's a seamstress, so dress and like how we present ourselves is something that I, I've grown up with. <laughs> but, uh, the, it, you know, by means of an autobiographical departure point in combination with, I guess, journalistic investigative techniques associated with documentary practices, I'm, I will ad my project will address larger issues pertaining to Italian immigration in Montreal 
the history of urban development and poor planning, uh, urban pla urban planning practices that aren't exactly, you know, well thought out, as well as exile and community displacement. And this is the Goose Village in the 60s before people were evicted. And as you can see, it's really, they have like a number, you know, and those numbers, the city had put those numbers because oh, they were going to okay. tear, these are the homes mm -hmm. that were torn down. And, you know, this, 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 this horrible, and like these are some of the homes, like their backyards, and the, the, one of the reasons the city wanted to evict people from their homes and tear down the neighborhood was because they felt that they, they, they felt that they were actually doing uh, a, a favor to this immigrant community because like they felt that the homes were very dilapidated and they considered it a okay. slum, and they were quite embarrassed uh, by it. So because people were coming into the city for Expo 67, they thought it was an embarrassment that that was Absolutely. the first thing you saw to the mm -hmm. in the city. But at the same time, not everybody's home looked like that and people had really invested in their property. You know, it was their first little piece of Canada and they and they and 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 all the people that I'm I'm speaking with because, you know, I'm I'm conducting interviews, they speak very fondly of this neighborhood and not in a romantic way, but they just felt that there there was a real sense of community and that it was really the first time that they felt uh, integrated within the Montreal landscape. And so, uh, and so, you know, these are very important uh, issues that I will uh, explore in my work. But like I said, from a very personal perspective, because it affected my family. Yes, and your father will be a kind of a. And my father is a, a, my father is the main protagonist of the of the project so far. I mean, it's very early days; it's very early stages of the work. But I'm I'm starting to work with him, and I'm 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 speaking to him as much as possible, and interviewing him, and photographing him. And in a weird way, yes, this is like you know the premise of of the project and the main. A nucleus of the project, but it's also a way for me to get to know him. Yes, how you know, old is he? He's 81, okay. and you know he's retired. He has a lot of time on his hands. He's really happy to help me. He's a very easy subject. Uh, really, really, really wonderful. Uh, but also, you know, you know, we're talking about difficult things. We're talking about a time in his life where he wasn't established, oh. or you know, that were very difficult, where he was experiencing racism, or you know, people treating him differently because he was an immigrant. Um, and I'm learning a lot about his life I'm as sure. Dominic, not as my dad. Okay. So, oh, so I want to get to know him as a person. Oh yes, but that's I also, great. And it's because of the situation, uh, because of this event that happened. So it's twofold, right? It's it's political, but it's also very personal. Right. And uh, I want to end on that image of him. Uh, yeah, with flowers. Yeah, yeah, the flowers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. he grows flowers. Yes, he does. Um, but you know, my father was one of those tenants in the three hundred building. Uh, low-income community, and it affected his life. It affected, you know, he he experienced those po the the my parents were evicted from their homes, and so and not just my parents, other people. So there will be other people that will be included in this project, and 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 it's I think for me what's important to note is that two things are happening: oral history is working its way into my work. I'm revisiting storytelling and autobiography, but I want to go back to your earlier question about how. Working in the Notman archives affected your my vision. vision. Yes. Well, it affected it, it my vision shows. in all of the things that I've explained. But one of the things that it helped me do was it helped me work with an archive. I had never worked with an archive. And for those that do work with an archive, it's extremely overwhelming. You're working with, uh, it's a very different way of working with images and information and how to make that information. You have to make it visual. How does that information become visual? And with this project, with the Goose Village project, I will be working with archives. I will be working with the Montreal City Archives, I will be working with Heritage Montréal, and, and other institutions where information about this neighborhood is available. So it, it has helped me a great deal to sort yes. of like face uh, the fear of getting into something that's so overwhelming. I don't know what will make... No, what, you don't know where I you're know. going. It's an experience, but it's very, it's fascinating. It's amazing, the turning. The, you, the new direction you're yeah. taking, but it all, you know, I'm really, uh, I'm looking forward to really yeah. seeing where you're going, but it's, it, it's... I'm in a very confused space right now, and, and, <laughs> and it's not like, it's not a bad thing, it's just that 
it's confusing and I need to sort of live that. I need to, because I, I, I'm not a documentary photographer even though I really want to be. I'm not. Uh, uh, you know, and I think that, how am I going to do that? Like, I'm not going to, I, I want to stay steadfast and true to my vision as an artist, to my aesthetic, but how do I do that with such a, with this kind of project, with this subject? And that's going to be the challenge, but it might yes. also be like, it's okay to do, yeah. I'll just, no, no, it's yeah. a creative process. It's freeing it's in a yes. way, yeah. So, so that's so Marissa, where I, yeah. I think we're reaching the end, and I thank you very much. Thank you. And uh, would you want to say something before we turn to the public? Sure. I just want to say uh, thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to talk about my work. Thank you to the McCord for giving me this residency opportunity. And thank you all for being here. And to the women that I photographed, thank you so, so much. Question from the public? So the, the Lachman photographs I know mostly are black and white. Yes. And you have chosen uh, color in it. How do you choose your palette? Um, it's intuitive, really. Like I'm thinking of, for instance, I was working with backdrops, you know, of art historical paintings and. You know, I was looking at the different backdrops and what would work with each. Sorry, I should use the microphone. What would work with each model, and I think that sort of dictated the direction I would take. You know, in terms of, um, you know, the kinds of uh, props I would buy or the kinds of flowers I would include, and then, uh, like I said, I sent mood boards to each model to show, um, to show them what the the set or the scene would consist of, and that helped them, you know, come to the. Uh, photographic shoot with their own clothes and it's it sort of worked that way. But it isn't, color is important and then when we worked, when Helen and I worked on the show together, you know, because of the ways in which that room upstairs is organized, the, the exhibition space, color was important in terms of how the images would be placed next to one another. So if you look, there are they're, they're very specific palettes on each wall. Like one wall is like in the pinks and, and, and lavenders and then one wall is in very primary colors. And in a way that the, the room helped dictate too how I would install the work and which images would be placed next to another. And the book, the book, and the book. is also organized yeah. the same way. Yeah, Color the book, is important in the, the book. Thank you, thank you. Uh, the catalog is also organized by, was uh, designed by Adam Sims. Adam is here. Hi, Adam. And uh, he designed it, and uh, we uh, worked on you know each chapter. There are not many chapters. There are four sections, but each section has a color palette. Yeah. Yes. Um, are you aware of why Notman was so interested in portraying women in his photos? Is there a specific reason? Um, I wouldn't know that. I, I mean, one of, one of the. But actually, there in in the Notman archives, there are not more women than men. There I chose to focus on women. You focus. Yeah. yeah. You focus. Uh, what? Uh, maybe I. She asked, uh, "Why would he be interested in? Why was he interested in women?" Uh. So my my idea he was not. I don't think he was more interested in women than men, just because he photographed family, the members. So the man came, and you can be sure that there's a lot of uh, men's photograph in the archive, portraits of men. And also, he 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 gained his notoriety, and he came. He gained international recognition and became more known when he was hired to document the Victoria Bridge, yes. the construction. So he didn't only do portraits, he also documented the city during a, a, a very important period in uh, Montreal's history. Okay. Um, so my only concern here, um, because um, when we think about um, the 19th century, um, especially in Canada, there was like all this tension with the United States and also the imperialistic needs of establishing Canada. So when we think about the art, the artwork, especially with um, Nutman, uh, Nutman um, we were talking mostly about how he portrayed women, but there's also the, the sub, um, the sub narrative behind also behind this, this kind of artwork. Um, like, I, I, like when I'm thinking about, um, I remember one of the picture, there was like, all the, the items of the, the usual cabinet of curiosity that we would see in the 19th century. Um, how was it for you to, um, to work with those kind of items? Um, 
especially in our, especially in our contemporary period where we kind of look back to the 19th century with that kind of colonialistic gaze of also to this kind of new way of um, consumption, let's say, this new um, vision of consumption. Um, yeah, I was, um, I was, sorry. Vous pouvez le dire en français, hein? Okay. Si C'était vous... comment pour vous de réexplorer un peu cette, cette, um, cette période-là, en fait, dans, dans okay. l'archive? So, uh, I just want to say that I, I put myself in the position of being in a 19th century studio, but I was not in a 19th century studio because as you know, I'm working today. And I wasn't trying to find props from a certain era. I was trying to, I was using props from this era. It's because there, there's, there's that conversation that's taking place between uh, a work of art, that, a, a body of work, an archive that was created by a photographer in the 19th century. But it was, you know, it's also my own take. I didn't do everything verbatim. I didn't take a picture of Notman and try to recreate it exactly, exactly the same. I just used similar strategies and I used similar ideas and I, I paid homage to uh, the studios of a bygone era to another era. One of the things that I do want to mention is that you talk about colony and, and, and you know, it was a very different time in Montreal. Yes, it was Anglophone. If you look at the, the, the primarily Anglophones, if you look at the images of the women that he photographed, they come from a certain class because photography, as you know, uh, was very expensive at the time. So, like, a lot of people didn't have access to photography. It wasn't as democratic as it is now. And I think, you know, when I look through the archive, it's obvious that there's you know, the same type of class that's being represented because of the very specific time in which he was working, which was Victorian Canada, Victorian Quebec. But in my work, I try to know, you know, like I'm not just going to show, you know, that class is may or may not be there, but it, there's a diversity in the images that uh, I may not have found in, uh, uh, that I did not find in uh, Notman's archive. Would and you, you, you were not doing an historical study? Uh, no. No. I was working as a contemporary female photographer. I am working as a contemporary photographer, uh, but I'm, I'm in conversation with a 19th century uh, photographer. So, so my images, there was no way I was going to start doing things like exactly the same. There are there's, there's nuances and making it my own, definitely. Thank Please you. Alisa, yeah. Well, there's a system, and there's a way of organizing your thoughts um, that can be very structured, but it could also be less structured. So I think with the archive at first, it became, um, you know, with the first series that uh, Zoe uh, curated, there was a lot of structure in terms, I had to, or it was my first time that I was um, working in the archive, and like I said, there were so many categories, there were so many images that I, you know, I really had to, I, I didn't know how to focus, so the best way to do it was have these, you know, categories, and then pull from those categories and, and see which ones I wanted to explore more or less. And then, uh, well, the second thing you talk about, okay, so... Uh, no, it's just more like even a mood board for me is a narrative. Like yes, 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 yes. So, so I think it's really interesting that you talk about It is a different, but I, I will say this, that, you know, I did this specifically for this project because it was so research-based and, you know, the residency aspect of it. But I'm not, I don't think I want to do that with everything. I don't, I don't always want to show that, you know, like with this new body of work, I don't know where it's going, but it might just be a film. It might just be 
that's it, you know? I, I may take like hundreds of photos, I may have, but it may just be, or it may be vignettes of different people speaking. And then my father just helped me start the project and he might not figure, he'll figure prominently, but he, may, he might not be the only protagonist. So yes, I, it is, this is very much, this new work is narrative based and it's definitely oral history is, a bit, is gonna play a very big part of it, yeah. Laurie? <coughs> talked about this um, fascination or experience of working with the archive, um, but I'm really wondering what it is about Notman's images of women that spoke to you, or what it is about those sets um, and those backdrops that was uh, sort of informed you in some way what did you what did you take from those images well like you know for me when I first encountered the uh, images when I first saw them like I said what I found really remarkable about his sitters was these are 19th century women they are you know and the names of each of the women is their husband's name unless they're not married then it's Miss Bell but if it's if it's not Miss Bell then it's Miss Mrs. Edgar, you know, Rosenthal or whatever, you know, uh, I'm making up names here, but you know, it, so there's that, the, the ways in which they were identified was very, not the ways in which we would identify women today. But, so that, you know, was something that I thought was, you know, I was thinking about that time and how women lived during that moment. And then I was looking at the images and there was a re, there was something that was very, there was that tension where these women seemed so in control. I didn't feel his pre I didn't feel a male presence. And there is, because he's taking the photo. But I just felt that for that time, he and it's my interpretation, that I feel that he was really ahead of his time in terms of like photographing women and how he portrayed them. I said, like I said before, they, I feel they have so much authority. They have so much uh, uh, composure and, and, and grace, but also they're they have, I feel that there was agency in the making of their portrait. I could be proven wrong, but it's the strength in the ways of the which, in the ways in which the women were portrayed by a 19th century photographer that uh, drew me to him initially. Okay, so, and then the props, well, you know, this kind of studio photography doesn't really exist anymore. So it was really like thinking of, a, like I, when I had, photographs taken myself as a child. Some of these studios, not so elaborate like this, but they still existed. You still, you know, like when we were kids, we went to a photographer and we had our photographs taken and there was a backdrop that was very much uh, a reference, an art historical painting. Uh, there were props. I mean, I, I grew up Catholic, so there were a lot of Bibles and there were a lot of <laughs> um, uh, religious, uh, yeah, yeah. Well, these photographs were taken during, uh, you know, my first communion or confirmation, but I, I don't feel that that exists anymore. And it's, and I, I find that really sad that, not, not the Bible part, but the part that, you know, these, 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 that's okay. But the part that, uh, that these studios don't exist anymore. Like they're, it's just, or like I was telling Alain, it was, I think there was a studio a while ago that was called Magenta that existed and it was like white backdrop or you saw the same thing. I don't know, it's just, it was a different way of, working within a commercial realm because this was a it was commercial photography mm -hmm. and when you think of commercial photography there now it you know in studios uh they're different i i i don't read them this yeah there's yes there is <laughs> are you offended <laughs> okay yeah there, and the, the, that piece of fur keeps popping up you know mm -hmm. and right and, 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 and uh, you know, th that kind of backdrop, uh, you know, keeps popping up. And so there's, there's, there's a lot of things that he reused. For instance, there's a dog, mm -hmm. you know, there's a, there's a dog that I kept seeing in these photographs and it was turned never facing me. And not me, but like never facing us. And I'm like, what's with this dog? And then you were saying it's taxidermed. I'm like, oh my God, okay. <laughs> That's I, I say it never changes position, you know. <laughs> it's because it's dead. That's why. Uh, uh, but you know, it can, you know, and I and if you look in in the work, the props keep popping up because I mean, 
you know, you, you and just reuse things and, and birds and, and like that was very Victorian too, like the cages and, and, and the objects. Absolutely. And it was much more elaborate, you know, than it is now. And, and uh, you know, there's something about that era that I really, really is part of my aesthetic and that I love. Yeah. Zoe? Oh. I think that's oh, fine. <laughs> Um, a difference between the two phases of the visual three, and this is the first phase, and yeah. upstairs is the second, and the first really seems more minimal to me, yeah. almost stark sometimes, yeah. and it's like you did a total flip, or, or like you completely embraced your maximalism <laughs> for the, this recent show, and is it just that you looked at the backgrounds and the, the studio props that allowed you to go in that direction in a way or yes but I also was so um, I don't know if it's this but I, I I I think that one of the things that was so amazing was that I was just becoming more and more and more involved and entrenched and like really uh, motivated and I did one and then I started doing another and then I just started getting busier and busier because the first portraits that I did for the studio with Naman are very minimal. There's a backdrop but I'm zoomed into, it's like if you see upstairs like one of the first images is of this girl Elisa Di Maria and she's just, it's just her. There's no flowers, there's no, there's there's nothing, you know? And that's how I started. Then I thought, oh, I don't know, you know? It's like, uh, I wanna add some things. And then I started adding a plant to the side and then I started adding, and then it, like I, and then it became more and more maximalist as I, as I, as I proceeded with the work. And I just, I just became more involved and I just looked at the studio a lot more closely. Whereas with this work, I was looking at the women a lot more closely. And not to say that I didn't look at the women with the second project, but there was, I was having a, yeah, there was a back and forth between the, the, the studio and the women. Hello. Okay, y'a pas de problème. C'est facile pour moi. J'aurais plein de questions, je vais essayer de faire court. J'ai vu l'exposition en haut, c'est très beau, merci beaucoup. Et puis, j'ai aussi vu le vidéo qui explique comment vous avez vu la démarche et tout ça. Et puis, c'est pour moi, ça a été très bon de voir ça avant. Ça m'a aidé à apprécier, à comprendre. Merci beaucoup pour ça. Mais j'ai une question plus. Vous dites que toutes les photos ont été faites en lumière naturelle. All the images she's asking if they were uh, done with daylight, yes, okay. we. Absolutely. Oh, oui. Uh, C'était l'été passé. It was last summer. Et puis je ne sais pas si vous vous souvenez. I don't know if you remember, but last summer was a disaster in terms of weather. Uh, one minute there was a storm. The next minute it was like super lit. And il y avait vraiment beaucoup, beaucoup de, 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 de cancellation, de annulation. Des, des, mais I, I couldn't keep doing that. So I had to find the solution. Okay. So initially I was working in my home. You know, and uh, you know, I trans I transformed a part of my home to look exactly, pour avoir le même regard, le même le même uh, uh, excuse-moi structure que le, le studio de Notman. Alors ça c'est une image d'une fille dans mon studio et côté droit il y a une lumière et ça c'est hiver, ok? Mais alors c'est c'était ça l'idée. Alors mais l'été passé c'était très it was very mercurial, like I, I had to find a solution. And the solution, la solution, c'était que j'ai commencé à utiliser mon balcon dans ma cour en arrière pour un bout de temps, quand il ne faisait pas beau, parce qu'au moins, il y avait la lumière naturelle que je pouvais travailler avec. Sinon, il y avait des moments que il fallait que je cancelle le, 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 la séance photographique parce que c'était trop sombre. And you, for, for those who are not in photography, if you don't have enough light, you're obviously, you know, it's, it's very difficult to photograph and you're at a very slow exposure and you're photographing people. 
But just pour vous dire, my exposures were very slow. They were not, you know, c'était un quinzième, un trentième, you know, they were very, very slow. Ah, c'est possible. Ah, oh, oui, 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 oui. Fixe, mais l'enfant, on sent un petit peu bouger, comme dans les photos, madame. Non, c'est normal. Puis, puis, puis c'est des erreurs que j'étais prêt à accepter. Non, non, mais c'était des affaires. I, I was willing to accept that. I, I wanted to work with that. OK, non, mais moi non plus, mais qu'est-ce que je veux dire, qu'est-ce que je veux dire, c'est que j'étais prêt à accepter les conséquences de la lumière naturelle. Je voulais apprendre. I wanted to learn also at the same time. And I thought, well, if Notman did it, I can do it. Why can't I do it, you know? Seulement avec un réflecteur. So she sees, like, in the eye of the subjects that there's, you know, like, sometimes you can see when a photographer is using a flash or any accessory. And she asked me if the only accessory I used was a reflector. And yes, the only accessory I used was a ex uh, reflector. Oui? Donc, on pourrait croire qu'à l'époque de Notman aussi, les cache-lights qui avaient étaient réalisés de la même façon, sans flash? Ah, oh, c'était absolument, oui, oui. Notman avait euh, la lumière naturelle, une fenêtre comme ça, et puis des réflecteurs aussi. On voit dans certaines photographies euh, qu'il utilise comme ça des, 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 des grandes toiles pour réfléchir la lumière sur son sujet. Oui, c'est ça. Alors, c'est exactement ça. Merci à vous. Non, rien. Non. More questions? But these ones were... Wonderful questions. Yes, they a, were. Thank you. Yep. Well, th thank you to both of you and all of you for being here tonight. The exhibition is accessible until February, so you can catch it tonight or come back. Um, thank you so much, Maria Luisa. And well, thanks to you. And <laughs> have a good night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.